1839, août-septembre, Strasbourg. Une demi-heure plus tard, c'était le crépuscule. L'aube à ma gauche étamait le bas du ciel. Un groupe de maisons blanches, couvertes de tuiles noires, se découpait au sommet d'une colline. Le véritable azur du jour commençait à déborder l'horizon. Quelques paysans passaient déjà allant à leurs vignes. Une lumière claire, froide et violette luttait avec la lueur cendrée de la lune. Les constellations pâlissaient. Deux des pléiades avaient disparu. Les trois chevaux du chariot descendaient rapidement vers leurs écuries aux portes bleues. Il faisait froid. J'étais gelée. Il a fallu lever les vitres. Un moment après, le soleil se levait et la première chose qu'il me montrait, c'était un notaire de village faisant sa barbe à sa fenêtre, le nez dans le miroir cassé sous un rideau de calicot rouge. Une lieue plus loin, les paysans devenaient pittoresques, les rouliers devenaient magnifiques. J'ai compté à l'un d'eux treize mulets attelés de chaînes largement espacées. On sentait l'approche de Strasbourg la vieille ville allemande. Tout en galopant, nous traversions Vasselonne, long boyau de maisons étranglées dans la dernière gorge des Vosges du côté de Strasbourg. Là, je n'ai pu qu'entrevoir une singulière façade d'église, surmontée de trois rochers ronds et pointus, juxtaposés, que le mouvement de la voiture a brusquement apporté devant ma vitre comme une décoration de théâtre. Tout à coup, à un tournant de la route, une brume s'est enlevée et j'ai aperçu le minster. Il était six heures du matin. L'énorme cathédrale, le sommet le plus haut qu'ait bâti la main de l'homme après la grande pyramide, se dessinait nettement sur un fond de montagne sombre d'une forme magnifique dans laquelle le soleil baignait çà et là de larges vallées. L'œuvre de Dieu faite pour les hommes, l'œuvre des hommes faite pour Dieu, la montagne et la cathédrale luttaient de grandeur. Je n'avais jamais rien vu d'aussi imposant. Hier, j'ai visité l'église. Le minster est véritablement une merveille. Les portails de l'église sont beaux, particulièrement le portail roman. Il y a sur la façade de très superbes figures à cheval. La rosace est noble, et bien coupé. Toute la face de l'église est un poème savamment composé, mais le véritable triomphe de cette cathédrale, c'est la flèche. Ah, la flèche est une vraie tiare de pierre, avec sa couronne et sa croix. C'est le prodige du gigantesque et du délicat. J'ai vu Chartres, j'ai vu Anvers. Il me fallait Strasbourg. L'église n'a pas été terminée, L'abside, misérablement tronquée, a été arrangée au goût du cardinal de Rohan. C'est un imbécile, l'homme au collier. Elle est hideuse. Le vitrail qu'on y a adapté a un dessin de tapis courant. C'est ignoble. Les autres vitraux sont beaux, excepté quelques verrières refaites, notamment celle de la Grande Rose. Toute l'église est honteusement badigeonnée. Quelques parties de sculptures ont été restaurées avec quelques goûts. Cette cathédrale a été touchée par toutes les mains. La chair est un petit édifice du XVe siècle, gothique, fleuri, d'un dessin et d'un style ravissant. Malheureusement, on l'adorait d'une façon stupide. Les fonds baptismaux sont de la même époque et supérieurement restaurés. C'est un vase entouré d'une broussaille de sculpture la plus merveilleuse du monde. L'église vue, je suis montée sur le clocher. Vous connaissez mon goût pour le voyage perpendiculaire. Je n'aurais eu garde de manquer la plus haute flèche du monde. Le minster de Strasbourg a près de 500 pieds de haut. Il est de la famille des clochers accostés d'escaliers à jour. C'est une chose admirable de circuler dans cette monstrueuse masse de pierre, toute pénétrée d'air et de lumière, évitée 
comme un joujou de Dieppe, lanterne aussi bien que pyramide qui vibre et palpite à tous les souffles du vent. Je suis montée jusqu'en haut des escaliers verticaux. J'ai rencontré en montant un visiteur qui descendait tout pâle et tout tremblant, à demi porté par son guide. Il n'y a pourtant aucun danger. Le danger pourrait commencer au point où je me suis arrêtée, à la naissance de la flèche proprement dite. Quatre escaliers, à jour, en spirale, correspondant aux quatre tourelles verticales, enroulées dans un enchevêtrement délicat de pierres amenuisées et ouvragées, s'appuient sur la flèche dont ils suivent l'angle et rampent jusqu'à ce qu'on appelle la couronne, à environ 30 pieds de distance de la lanterne surmontée d'une croix qui fait le sommet de l'église. Les marches de ces escaliers sont très hautes et très étroites et vont se rétrécissant à mesure qu'on monte, si bien qu'en haut, elles ont à peine la saillie du talon. Il faut gravir ainsi une centaine de pieds et le monte à 400 pieds du pavé. Point de garde-fou ou si peu qu'il n'est pas la peine d'en parler. L'entrée de cet escalier est fermée par une grille en fer. On n'ouvre cette grille que sur une permission spéciale du maire de Strasbourg. Et l'on ne peut monter qu'accompagné de deux ouvriers couvreurs qui vaut nous autour du corps une corde dont ils attachent le bout de distance en distance à mesure que vous montez aux barres de fer qui relient les menots. Il y a huit jours, trois femmes, trois Allemandes, une mère et ses deux filles, ont fait cette ascension. Du reste, personne, excepté les couvreurs qui ont à restaurer le clocher, ne monte jusqu'à la lanterne. Là, il n'y a plus d'escalier, mais de simples barres de fer disposées en échelon. D'où j'étais. La vue est admirable. On a Strasbourg sous ses pieds, vieille ville à pignons dentelés et à grands toits chargés de lucarnes, coupés de tours et d'églises, aussi pittoresques qu'aucune ville de Flandre. L'île et le Rhin, deux jolies rivières, égayent ce sombre amas d'édifices que de leur flasque, dans leurs flasques d'eau claire et verte. Tout autour, des murailles s'étendent à perte de vue. Une immense campagne pleine d'arbres et semée de villages. Le Rhin s'approche à une lieue de la ville, court dans cette campagne en se tordant sur lui-même. En faisant le tour du clocher, on voit trois chaînes de montagnes. Les croupes de la forêt noire au nord, les Vosges à l'ouest, au midi, les Alpes. On est si haut que le paysage n'est plus un paysage, c'est comme ce que je voyais sur la montagne de Heidelberg, une carte de géographie. Mais une carte de géographie vivante avec des brumes, des fumées, des ombres et des lueurs, des frémissements d'eau et de feuilles, des nuées, des pluies et des rayons de soleil. Le soleil fait volontiers fête à ceux qui sont sur de grands sommets. Au moment où j'étais sur le Minster, il a tout à coup dérangé les nuages dont le ciel avait été couvert toute la journée et il a mis le feu à toutes les fumées de la ville, à toutes les vapeurs de la plaine, tout en versant une pluie d'or sur Saverne dont je revoyais la côte magnifique à douze lieues au fond de l'horizon à travers une gaze resplendissante. Derrière moi, un gros nuage pleuvait sur le Rhin. À mes pieds, la ville jasait doucement et ses paroles m'arrivaient à travers des bouffées de vent les cloches de cent villages sonnaient. Moi, j'allais, d'une tourelle à l'autre, regardant ainsi tour à tour la France, la Suisse et l'Allemagne dans un rayon de soleil. Chaque tourelle fait face à une nation différente. En redescendant, je me suis arrêtée quelques instants à l'une des portes hautes de la tourelle escalier. Des deux côtés, les figures en pierre des deux architectes du Minster. Ces deux grands poètes sont représentés accroupis. Le dos et la face renversés en arrière, comme s'ils s'émerveillaient de la hauteur de leur œuvre. Je me suis mis à faire comme eux. Et je suis resté pendant quelques minutes. Sur la plateforme, on m'a fait écrire mon nom dans un livre. Après quoi, je m'en suis allée.
Thank you, Lola Moon. We will continue on this trip to Strasbourg. I would like to welcome Frédéric de Genève for his uh, conference on the skills needed to build and to adorn the Cathedral of Strasbourg. Frédéric de Genève is the workshop director at the Fondation de l'Oeuvre Notre Dame. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. A few words on the reading we have just heard. I feel a lot of uh, tension, obviously, because I'm, I am the first one to speak this morning, but now I'm fully relaxed. After listening to this excerpt, I, w I heard about the Cathedral of Strasbourg and the spire, this beautiful stone uh, masterpiece that uh, Victor Hugo mentions in his letter. Uh, the Cathedral of Strasbourg was the higher uh, stone uh, cr construction of Christianity at 142 meters of height. The uh, Cologne uh, Cathedral is now higher, but at the 19 in the 19th century, it was the uh, tallest uh, uh, Christian cathedral, and it remains today the tallest Gothic. Uh, um, cathedral today. Uh, I often talk about this with my German, German colleagues. It is a beautiful spire indeed. So this morning I will talk about this uh, magnificent cathedral which is represented in our imagination by, by this unique spire. In Strasbourg there's, there is a specificity. The workshop that was created at the end of the 13th century is still today by the cathedral, looking after the cathedral. It has been 800 years since the foundation of L'Oeuvre Notre Dame has uh, uh, continued its uh, expertise, savoir-faire uh, uh, on uh, sandstone to uh, restore and protect the cathedral. I would like to present to you this morning this uh, wonderful institution. First of all, I will give you a little historical background. For 800 years, the Cathedral of Strasbourg has been maintained by a specific institution, the uh, Oeuvre Notre Dame. It's a secular institution which was created, first of all, to collect the funds uh, uh, to, do, to do this work and to bring together the different trades that were necessary to build, uh, to, to do this work of restoration. The, the institution was under the leadership of the commune, first of all, uh, from the end of the 13th century. That's, that is also a specificity. The, uh, uh, there was a famous battle, the Battle of Hausbogen, in uh, 1262, 1262, which marked the uh, um, the leadership of this uh, foundation, which would shift under the leadership of the city, Strasbourg freed itself from the empire, Germanic empire, until the end of the 18th century. It survived the revolution. This institution, when most uh, uh, pr French plants were disappearing under the nationalization of the goods of the clergy, it is still present today with all of this legacy. There are a few highlights to remember the creation at the beginning of the 13th century. Uh, the first uh, mention dates back from 1224, uh, the Hausbergen battle, uh, then the autonomy of the institution, which became a secular institution under the uh, guidance of the, Stras uh, the city of Strasbourg. Uh, 1439 is also an important date. It's the end, uh, the official end of the Cathedral of Strasbourg and the spire. The spire is at 142 meters of height. In uh, 1459, uh, Strasbourg was uh, 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 nominated as the Supreme Lodge of the uh, Roman Empire. 
so it was uh, uh, recognized, the, the supremacy of Strasbourg was recognized then and was recognized as the supreme lodge of the Roman Empire. And it was able to arbitrate when there were conflicts between the master and the apprentices. Then the French Revolution, the French Revolution for, for a period of 10 years uh, will deprive uh, the Oeuvre de Notre Dame of its uh, goods, of its institution. In 1803, Napoleon Bonaparte, the first consul, will give back to the foundation, the goods and funds uh, uh, to the institution. So from a historical point of view, this is our birth, official birth, thanks to the consular decree of 1803 from uh, Napoleon Bonaparte. Then there were wars, several occupations uh, of uh, France, uh, 1870, uh, uh, France, uh, was under the German Empire. It was then uh, freed uh, in 1914, 1939, under the Third Reich, it became German again. So obviously, it's a very complex history uh, uh, between uh, uh, for Strasbourg with a very specific statute. There's, there is also a framework convention between the state and the foundation in 1999. It's a very specific status. Uh, 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 the foundation does not own the monument. It is the state which owns it. And thanks to customs law, the foundation is uh, the institution which uh, looks after the maintenance of the cathedral. And Miss, an architect is appointed in particular to uh, look after the cathedral. Uh, one architecture is architect is also appointed by the government. Uh, Catherine Trotman, our previous mayor of uh, Strasbourg, who then became uh, after became uh, the Ministry of Culture under her initiative, uh, the foundation. Uh, uh, became the owner, was authorized to uh, conduct its own works uh, uh, through a framework convention. And uh, the foundation now has the delegation to conduct the works on the cathedral today. So we have a, one unique architect uh, from the historical monuments, which has the two uh, uh, hats, uh, a state architect and uh, an architect for the foundation as well. Strictly speaking, the uh, head office of the foundation since its crea creation at the beginning of the 13th century is on the south flank of the cathedral. Uh, very close to the former Episcopal uh, Palace that uh, Victor Hugo mentioned. So this large Gothic house uh, was built in 1347. It's uh, made out of bricks. It was enlarged at the end of the 16th century. You see the second house on the right here uh, with the Renaissance uh, style. At this time, there was an impressive staircase, staircase helicoidal uh, shaped uh, staircase. And you also have the lodge of uh, the stone masons in which uh, you have the expertise of, uh, of the uh, craftsmen that are displayed. So today, the Oeuvre Notre Dame, the foundation, uh, still has a specificity. You can see a picture here on this slide from the 19th century. That's the historical uh, seat of the foundation. We still have the office of our director today, the administrative part, the foundation. At the back, there is a building which can be seen, uh, uh, the, the workshops of the cathedral, uh, just uh, uh, next to adjoined, adjoining the uh, museum. The monument belongs to, the building belongs to the foundation. And since 1831, the Museum Oeuvre Notre Dame uh, 
uh, has been uh, nestled in this building and you can visit this museum today which is focusing on s the statues of the cathedral the ornamentation and for those who are interested in gothic art there's a beautiful collection of uh, which can be seen since 2015 you have an interpretation room at the last uh, on the last floor you have an original uh, you have the original drawing sketches of this gothic cathedral with uh, kept those uh, drawings uh, on site uh, uh, which is quite uh, uh, outstanding. So you have the cathedral, the workshop dedicated to the maintenance and restoration of the Alsatian monument, as well as the collection of the blueprints with a museum that presents the original sculptures and, and statues. Uh, uh, it, it is a very original um, situation. On the right, I was talking about the former room of the uh, stonemason's lodge on the right of this slide. The logo of the foundation. Uh, I took part in this uh, drawing, in, this, in the making of this uh, uh, logo. It's uh, in, in Alsatian, it's called Manola, which is the little man. Uh, I also uh, wanted to show the geometrical aspect of our work. Uh, uh, it's the empirical uh, side of geometry, the practical side of geometry. That is uh, our logo with this uh, little man, uh, man little man, which you can find on uh, many facings of the cathedral, on the uh, uh, astronomical uh, clock as well. This logo may be found uh, in various places. A specific context, three missions, which I briefly mentioned to you. One, a private structure, a foundation that is private. It has its own capital. It has amassed through the centuries uh, donations, uh, which were uh, um, invested in real estate. Since the 13th century, it is a private foundation, yes, but it is under the leadership of the mayor of Strasbourg. A three-party management for the cathedral. Again, quite an original uh, arrangement. Uh, if we talk about the cathedral of uh, uh, Notre Dame de Paris, you have a classified uh, cathedral uh, uh, building and the restoration will be uh, done uh, from uh, private contractors with a specific uh, 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 specific bids that are uh, uh, put on the market but in Strasbourg the foundation is in charge of conducting the works to restore the cathedral so Every two months, we organize uh, meetings with these three parties, the state, the foundation, and the workshop. So these uh, stakeholders uh, meet to talk about the coordination of works, uh, future plans, and to discuss uh, different means of communications, to discuss the strategy related to the monument. What are... Uh, the missions, we have to fund the works to be completed. This is uh, written in the consular decree from 1803. The revenue of uh, uh, the foundation should be focusing on the funding of the works. This is our uh, vocation. I'm often asked that question. Can you uh, work on other monuments in Strasbourg? Well, the answer is no. We have the exclusivity of the maintenance of Strasbourg. This is our mission. This is our DNA. We have a document a library, which we keep. It's a very exhaustive collection. Strasbourg is one of the most documented cathedral. We have a gypsotheca. We have a collection of photographs, uh, of blueprints. We have 100,000 items uh, in this uh, uh, library. 
So we are in charge again of the restoration of the cathedral. What are the financial resources uh, uh, of uh, this maintenance? Uh, Obviously, you need the appropriate funding in order to conduct this uh, uh, restoration. In the past, in the 12th, 13th century, to fund the works uh, during the construction of the cathedral, this came from uh, um, donations. Erwin, uh, uh, the great Erwin who constructed uh, the uh, uh, western part of the cathedral and the uh, uh, rows of the cathedral, he uh, uh, made a donation uh, uh, when he died. Uh, so we have uh, 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 real estate and uh, funds uh, to uh, uh, dedicated to the restoration of the monument. This uh, tradition of uh, uh, donations, uh, sponsorship, uh, patronage uh, uh, has been kept uh, to uh, maintain the cathedral. The revenue comes from uh, a specific platform that can be visited. It is the plateau that is uh, uh, situated uh, at a height of 60 meters. Uh, it's the beginning of the uh, uh, spire. You have a, a very uh, beautiful panorama. Thanks to this, we have 1 million euros per year that are collected. We have the Carmerzel house that you can see on this slide. It's a famous restaurant in uh, Strasbourg. Uh, um, it belongs to the foundation, so this also constitutes a means of funding the works. The city of Strasbourg also um, provides funds around 1 million euros per year. So yearly we have 3.2 million in terms of budget from these different sources. The foundation, the, the state is the owner of the building. Uh, we uh, provide a, a donation of 1.5 uh, million euros, uh, which corresponds to the work conducted by the workshop. This is for equipment, uh, tools, uh, the operations of the, the work. We, uh, so, so, so this is the amount that has been calculated for the works. This is the platform I was talking about. So the niche of the statue of the of Saint Arbocast. We had a patronage operation to restore this statue, which was removed and uh, kept in our collection of statues to review the niche uh, uh, of Saint Arbocast entirely. The collection, very important collections. As I was saying, we have. Uh, a collection, two collections, in fact, that are very exhaustive. The library, first of all. We have about 7,000 references, works uh, focusing on Gothic art, uh, craftsmanship, uh, savoir-faire, expertise, different kinds of expertise, a collection of blueprints, about 7,000 pieces. Uh, uh, kept uh, from the originals, uh, which I mentioned. We have 30 original blueprints from uh, the Gothic drawings of the cathedral, as well as uh, a number of blueprints uh, all the way to today. We have uh, uh, different campaigns today. We have parchments to digital blueprints uh, with a very high definition to show you the range of uh, the, these uh, different items. We also have a gallery of casts, uh, 5,000 of them. It's very impressive indeed. It is on two levels. It is made of uh, almost all of the ornamental statues of the cathedral. This collection was started from the second half of the 19th century during the restoration campaigns, stamping campaigns, casting campaigns, and today we have about 5,000 examples of these. 
Most of these casts, plasters, are used by us. Uh, Obviously, uh, we also have a 3D digital database. Our 3D uh, model uh, is uh, in the shape of casts. It's a very complex uh, uh, savoir-faire. Uh, only a few institutions know how to do that. It's very technical. And today, we use these castings and plasters uh, for the restoration work, so it's a very precious uh, document uh, base. Uh, we use it for our preliminary studies uh, to request uh, the authorize uh, to, to have the authorization to work. So we have the prints of statues uh, which are now alterated uh, or damaged during the French Revelation. More than 250 statues were severely damaged and removed from the monument. Um, the collection started after the French Revolution, but we have a double uh, copy uh, uh, of uh, these uh, statues, uh, and most of them are in the museum. Earlier, I was talking about the Framework Convention, uh, from which we uh, date we've had the delegation of uh, the maintenance. Here you have a few pictures showing some of the works we have conducted. Two years we finalized the uh, restoration of the south southern facade of the transept. It took 10 years. It was very complex indeed. Uh, a mix of restoration works uh, on the sandstone, but also uh, the glassware, the uh, stained glasses, the polychromy, and the uh, cover, the roof. We had different uh, batches coming from the state and others uh, from the foundation. So this needed uh, a little adjustment uh, uh, to uh, work to together. Uh, usually, we have the exclusivity of the works, but since uh, the year 2000, we conduct the works jointly. Uh, we work on these work sites together with the states according to the different skills that are needed. So here you see the work site of the Saint Laurent portal. portal. I will have the opportunity to show you these works in more detail. So we uh, plan for the restoration of these works. Here you have a specific schedule dedicated to that. The monument belongs to the state. The state has to upkeep uh, the monument. But in Strasbourg, you have the Oeuvre Notre Dame, the foundation. So in 1999, as I said, uh, we established the framework convention. We have a multi-year schedule of uh, the maintenance works. Uh, uh, um, so supervised by the lead architect. Uh, first of all, we need to look at the health, the general health of the monument. Uh, a full study, full diagnosis is uh, carried out. Uh, the urgent works uh, uh, will be uh, carried out first. Uh, electricity, the stained glasses, and batches uh, uh, li uh, linked to uh, stone masonry. We have a steering committee that meets every two, three years uh, under the uh, leadership of the prefect, uh, the bishop, the state services, and the foundation. And according to the skills, the means, and uh, above all, the, the competences, uh, for example, the foundation works uh, uh, with uh, sandstone uh, batches, masonry, sculpture, conservation, casts. The batches dedicated to the state are uh, mainly the coverage, the stained glasses, uh, the glass uh, uh, works, uh, electricity compliance. So here you have the schedule all the way to 2032 roughly. So I know what are the future work sites to be conducted. When we arbitrate for these different works, we start the preparation of the work sites with the pre-study. Uh, th there are a series of uh, uh, requests uh, uh, because this is governed by a number of regulations uh, uh, for the restoration of, of historical monuments in France, uh, a presentation of our teams. 
There are 24 people working in the workshops uh, out of 30 working with the foundation and then we also have th two apprentices and one for a, a temp uh, companion. These are trainees training to become a companion and they spend uh, one year, two years with us to learn about uh, sandstone cutting and sculpture because sandstone is a very specific material. So we have a stone cutting uh, workshop. We have um, uh, um, locksmith. We have a team dedicated to the work site, etc., etc. You can see on the, on the picture that we also have a workshop in which we cut um, large blocks because we, 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 we work with sandstone. So in Lameno, we have a, really a collection of sandstone blocks, 130, 150 uh, um, blocks. And you can see the person in charge of this uh, storage. And we have, uh, uh, an, we, we talk to people managing quarries in Alsace. And the uh, storage manager visits these quarries on a regular on a regular basis and makes his choices depending on the quality expected for the sandstone that we're going to use within the context of our work. Just a few words about the UNESCO listing. In 2020, the group of workshops working with European cathedrals so that's five countries, France, Germany, uh, Austria, Norway, and Switzerland. Uh, this group and their work became listed in the World Heritage of UNESCO. So the objective was to protect the ability to, uh, to transfer expertise and transmit expertise, because at the moment we are doing things manually, but digital technologies are progressing very fast. But in Strasbourg, for instance, we decided to maintain our skills in manual stone cutting. And we see that digital technologies are, 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 are being used with the 3D modeling and then the use of digital tools to do the rough cutting of stones, but we made a choice. That's our DNA in Strasbourg. We continue doing that uh, manually. Uh, so this group was listed uh, as part of the intangible world heritage of UNESCO. Um, then we also, apart from large restoration works, we have to uh, maintain the building on a daily basis. So here you can see some pictures of works that we made. Um, we use people working on ropes uh, and climbing up the cathedral. So we now have a team doing that uh, to maintain uh, the roof and the windows and to do the uh, current uh, ma maintenance, uh, repair a lock and, um, and grease hinges, for instance. So we have this team of climbers, rope climbers, to avoid having to use um, more complex equipment. So here they're just unclogging the gargoyles. That's all they're doing, but uh, it needs doing. And then you can see that as they climbed up the walls, we realized, and you can see that on the second picture, you can see that in order to restore this element, this this gargoyle, where well, we had to remove it first because it was about to fall. So first it was a matter of protecting visitors. So we uh, took it out, we made a cast, and we produced the exact copy. We are currently producing the exact copy of it so as to put it back in place. Another interesting thing, we chose to have a falcon um, resting place 
in Ospire because in the region we have lots of uh, pilgrim falcons. So uh, in order to protect nature, we chose to have this uh, nest platform so that this uh, pair of uh, falcon uh, would make the cathedral their home. And by the way, they destroy lots of pigeons, which is good for us. And one specificity to the right, you see that the top of the spire uh, flies the uh, French flag once a year on November 25th as uh, in memory of the Kufra oath, which has to do with the liberation of Strasbourg. Because uh, the uh, then General Leclerc took an oath in Libya in Kufra to say that he would never rest until the day the French flag would fly on the city of Strasbourg. So as a tribute, this is the only religious uh, building in France that, show, that flies the French flag once a year. So a few words about uh, the, the, the site, the, the, the restoration works. I told you about the restoration of the San Lorenzo portal. That's the project of 1494, that's the original blueprint. That was the intention of the uh, builder that's drawn here on, on, on the blueprint, and that's uh, still visible and accessible with a certain number of precautions because we don't want this blueprint to be exposed to UVs, for instance. But it can be seen. And the portal was uh, built between 1494 to 15. Oh five, and the, that's the current portal. It's an auto mosaic plan that was made using a drone before we started the works. One specificity of our foundation is that we take fully part to the preliminary studies, and I personally work on drafting the preliminary studies, working obviously with the main architect. Another thing that we have to do in our works is, well, we have to make a diagnosis. But, and we need to have uh, a, a direct contact with the monument. We need to see the area where we're going to work. So we uh, install a scaffolding on site. Uh, this San Lorenzo portal was equipped with a scaffolding for one year before the work started so that we had a clear vision and understanding of what was required during the works. So during the this period, which we call the diagnosis period, we, we take all information we need to then come up with a restoration plan, as you can see here. You have a color code in blue. These are elements that we will just um, manage with a conservation approach, because over the f over the, the last few years we've decided to focus on conservation and to uh, to favor an approach that uh, allows for the conservation of various statues in place. There is no reason why we should uh, take them away when we can restore them in situ. So we've uh, trained a specific team that can do that. And today we have the required expertise to do this work with our own team. So in blue, you have uh, those uh, statues that are altered. But these are original elements that will require a remineralization, uh, desalting, microabrasion. There is a whole palette of possibilities that we can use depending on the treatment that's required. In orange, these are the elements that we will have to replace with uh, a, a, a perfect copy because the uh, durability of sandstone is just uh, 100 years, roughly. So the top part, which we call the crown, has to be, well, there are uh, railings that need to be replaced. What you see in orange, those elements that need to be replaced, were already replaced uh, between 
1920 and 1930. As I said, uh, the uh, building is entire, it's entirely um, uh, restored each century. So we had the first campaign in 1920, and now we're back to another one. So this is just to show you what we do once the planning has been agreed upon with the state. We start um, disinstalling the statues, removing the uh, damaged elements. So there again, we are on what we call the crown. That's the top railing at the top of the portal. In parallel to that, we also work to take a very detailed sketch of the uh, element. And to do that, we need a, a, a matrix, what we call a matrix. So we take a drawing at the one-to-one -one scale. And sometimes the profiles are very complex in Strasbourg, the geometry is a very complex that's a gothic architecture it can be very complex so we have an expert that surveys all that and copies all this on paper and on zinc afterwards so that the stone cutter knows exactly what he needs to cut then you have the restoration of the slab in the the cutting department is provided with the exact dimension to cut the slab. The slab is then sent to the stone cutter. He gets also the template and he makes a sketch on the slab. It's just a, an engraving on the, on the slab to determine those areas that need to be cut out and show the and uh, on the railing of the handrail and with this information the stone cutter is capable of starting cutting it's exclusively manual for a hand railing we admit uh, taking uh, drilling holes with the machine to remove um, to to rough cut the the the, the, the railing here are some elements that you can see that were rough cut with a machine and then the, the, the last part of the work was done manually, obviously. There are many discussions with the architect, whom you can see here, the architect of historical buildings. And here in this cycle of conferences, we've been talking about know-how and expertise. And quite obviously for us, uh, Maintaining these skills in manual cutting and sculpting is very important. Why? Well, because we want to continue using the tools that were used at the time when the monument was built. So here, for instance, you have a slab that's going to be used in the portal. Copies were made at the end of the 19th century. Since the Middle Ages, the, the tools have changed and evolved. But we need to take ownership of these tools and make them match with the period of construction and restoration. For instance, there were tools in the Middle Ages that disappeared during the Great Plague a pandemic. Uh, we restored these tools thanks to the different markings we found on on the stone uh, because sandstone is very often marked by the tools like chisels for instance so when we find these marks that helps us determine what kind of tools were used to cut the stone then we uh, re-engineer the uh, middle ages practices and we make a, a copy using those tools that were originally used to cut the, pi the, the, the element. So that's the finished railing. This one is uh, roughly 1 meter 60 centimeters, maybe 1 meter 80 centimeters in length. That's 650 hours of work 
fine uh, cutting, lots of work. That's outstanding. That's late flamboyant gothics, very complex, with an intertwine of fine uh, um, uh, curves. And it's difficult to do anything uh, finer with the sandstone, to be honest. So that's the presentation of this uh, element. And it was cut by stone cutters because we make a distinction between the work of stone cutters and sculptures. Sculptors, stone cutters work on on the architecture, and they uh, cut uh, geometrical um, uh, elements. They respect geometry. They need uh, uh, calipers. They need rulers, etc. So this one was. Um, cut by stone cutters. And then there is the part reserved to sculptures, to sculptors. That's for gargoyles and chimeras, uh, uh, everything that represents uh, plants and, and, and animals, that's for sculptors. So the sculptor needs a drawing, a sketch. They need to be uh, supported. And they uh, use a mold or a cast. So either a plaster cast or an earth earthenware uh, mold, and it's based on a 3D molding that they can make a copy. To the right, you have a cornice. The geometrical part, that was done by the stone cutters, but what we call the reservation for sculpture, that's going to be placed in the hand of the sculptor. You have the pinnacle, I mean the top part here, as received after the stone cutter has done his job. And then the ornament will be provided by the sculpting de department, the sculptor's department. That's the pinnacle completed. So you see it's a combination of the work from both the stone cutters and the um, sculptors. So that's the pyramid you can find on the pinnacle. That's 450 hours of work with uh, six or eight uh, sculptors and stone cutters that worked on this uh, element. They all have a passion for their work. And as a tribute to our sculptors, we have uh, a team of three sculptors and two of them ha have been granted the honor of have been appointed best sculptor in France. Um, so these are hand railings as well, but which include sculpting, which you can see to the right. Sculptors used a cast molding, uh, plaster mold, plaster cast, sorry, uh, because they were available, so they managed to, to use them. That's another picture I wanted to show you because that was uh, our, that was what we had on our uh, Christmas card this year. You can see uh, this element, and you see that the decor element made of stone are part and parcel of the facade. There is rigor, there is precision, there are details, there is harmony. Everything is revealed here with this uh, set of stones that are positioned at the east of the cathedral. I was telling you about our sculpture collec collections They're located in the Renaissance wing, wing of uh, the Maison Notre Dame. Uh, other statues are kept in the museum. So these are the early 16th century statues that are around the, the portals. You also see some pinnacles because uh, the original pinnacles were dismantled and um, protected within the museum. To the left, a presentation of the statues that were uh, dismantled from the portal. These are statues that were restored in, t in 1920. They are in a very good condition, so all we need to do is to to do conservation work here. 
we conducted a few tests and two weeks ago we finalized microabrasion operations to clean the statues. There are very few alterations. There are parts that are missing, like in, on the feet of the statues, but the, by and large they're in a ver very good condition. So uh, we will just need to clean them, restore them, and put them back in place in the portal. To the right, you can see people discussing about restoration because we work with the architect uh, and we regularly have uh, these um, discussions with the architect uh, that's at least every two weeks because in the study we also allow for research so we have time we have five percent time allocation that we can use to to study to make research uh, l like for statues for instance it was difficult to make uh, um, a thorough study because they were sort of glued to the wall so we had to to, to take them out first before we could uh, actually decide on the restoration work that was needed so that's why we have this five percent time budget and we started working on cutting on the tools that need to be used on the hoisting uh, means that we are going to use the marks left by stone cutters you know that the stone cutters uh, mark uh, is important for, for these guys to get paid because they're paid per stone that they've cut. So that's why they place their mark to say, I made it. And this mark then evolves over time uh, all the way until the end of the 17th century where marks became very refined indeed. Uh, another detail here that's a rediscovery, because in the study, this is something that we'd not um, uh, observed, but our art historian dug in uh, our documents, and she discovered this small angel on this uh, sketch. So that's an angel, last part of the 15th century, so our art historian had this drawing, this sketch, and then in the statue collection of the uh, Musée Notre Dame Museum, she discovered that there were similitudes in the representation of the angel in the document with this angel that we call the angel with feathers that we had in our statue collection. So we realized that originally this angel was located on the portal. So we asked the curator of the museum if for one specific operation, if we could remove the angel, take it out from the collection and place it directly where it was supposed to be. So we have a representation and in the angel location, we had kind of a ghost presence of the uh, of the angel with the hook uh, that allows to keep it in place, as if it was a painting. So we repositioned the angel where it uh, was originally, and then we decided to uh, work on a copy of this angel so that uh, we could uh, complete the restoration of the portal. Okay, now talking about communication very quickly. So we also take part in 
various events to give visibility to our work. So that's during the European Days of National Heritage. We have uh, public coming to see how we work. It's always very interesting to show to people how, how we work because our craftsmen have a passion for their work and they love telling about their, their craft and they need uh, recognition and talking to the public is part of that. And our last, in September last year, General Georges Lain, the uh, person in charge of restoring Notre Dame in Paris, wanted to meet with us, so we talked to him. To him. But uh, the Strasbourg model of maintaining a cathedral might be, might or could be copied in Paris for Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. What he was interested in was to see that the documentation was centralized, is centralized in Strasbourg. Everything is centralized in one single place. Well, in Paris, it's a bit complex. The, we have national archives, etc. It's complex. But the model we have in, in Strasbourg was of interest to General Georges Lain. Uh, our financial model and business model was also of interest to him. Uh, in Paris, they might take some ideas and copy the way we work. Thank you for your attention. So now we'll listen to Lola again for a reading. Uh, it's a text that Rodin published in 1914 on French cathedrals. Il n'y a pas de commencement. Prenez comme vous arrivez. Arrêtez-vous à ce qui vous séduit d'abord. Et travaillez. Vous entrerez petit à petit dans l'unité. La méthode naîtra des proportions de l'intérêt. Les éléments que votre regard sépare dans leur premier aspect, pour les analyser, vont s'unir et composer le tout. Dans le doux exil du travail, on apprend d'abord la patience, qui elle-même nous enseigne l'énergie, et celle-ci nous donne donc la jeunesse éternelle, faite de recueillement et d'enthousiasme. De là, on peut voir et comprendre la vie, cette vie délicieuse, que nous dénaturons par les artifices de notre esprit peu aéré, entouré que nous sommes pourtant des chefs-d'œuvre de la nature et de l'art. Mais nous ne les comprenons plus. Oisifs, en dépit de notre agitation aveugle environnée de splendeur. Si nous parvenions à comprendre l'art gothique, nous serions irrésistiblement ramenés à la vérité comme elle était vraie, juste et féconde, la méthode de nos vieux maîtres du XIe au XVIIIe siècle. Cette méthode, c'est, en grand et dans l'union de toutes les forces humaines d'une époque, la méthode même de nos activités individuelles, quand elles sont bien conduites. C'est la collaboration perpétuelle de l'homme avec la nature. En effet, où faut-il chercher la science Partout. Il faut la demander au moindre, comme capitale circonstance de la vie, à notre instinct comme à notre réflexion. C'est souvent dans les choses d'apparence modeste qu'on apprend le plus. Le travail est mystérieux. Il accorde beaucoup aux patients et aux simples. Il refuse aux pressés et aux vaniteux. Il accorde à l'apprenti. Il refuse à l'élève et, un jour, la merveille naît des mains du modeste travailleur. Où ai-je compris la sculpture Dans les bois, en regardant les arbres, sur les routes, en observant la construction des nuages, dans l'atelier, en étudiant le modèle partout, excepté dans les écoles. 
ce que j'ai appris de la nature, j'ai tâché de le mettre dans mes œuvres. C'est ainsi que dans ses œuvres maîtresses, le gothique a fait entrer les jardins, les vergers, les espaliers, ainsi que les forêts, après les rochers et tous les légumes amis de la chaumière, et toutes les légendes aimées aussi des pauvres, et tous les plus délicats détails comme les plus sublimes épisodes de la vie. Et il ne s'est pas contenté d'emprunter partout à la nature, par un labeur constant, humble et passionné, des beautés pour en composer la fête des jours. Il s'est assimilé aussi, pour renouveler cette fête, pour l'entretenir en, en la variant, les lois qui président aux créations naturelles, juste méthode qui lui a permis de se nuancer sans se démentir et de continuer à charmer des générations nouvelles. Ces variations, ce sont les passages d'un style à l'autre. Avec quelle souplesse, quelle richesse d'invention, le génie français tourne d'époque en époque pour introduire une phase nouvelle dans le style architectural. Il ne dérange rien de ce qu'il était. Il ne contredit en rien les principes de la phase accomplie. On suit l'ordre, comme fait la nature elle-même pour tirer un fruit d'une fleur. C'est une transmission de vie. La fleur et le fruit, ce sont les modèles gothiques. On apprend beaucoup en étudiant les concordances, les correspondances, les analogies, car la même loi régit la vie morale et la vie sensible, à la condition qu'on ait déjà le sentiment de cette loi générale. Les gothiques l'avaient, mais ces découvertes sont des récompenses. On ne les obtient qu'après bien des efforts, bien des pas sur une longue route, sans compter les digressions par les chemins de traverse et les haltes méditantes au carrefour. C'est le gothique qui a produit la Renaissance française, en déduisant de ses principes certains leurs conséquences. On dirait plus justement que renaissance, déclinaison, ce n'est pas moins la force qui enfante la grâce et l'esprit, et c'est un rêve en plusieurs joies. L'esprit heureux se déroule en ornement comme un serpent au soleil. Quel pays Celui qui possédait la vitalité. On la conserva jusqu'au jour de lassitude et de mensonges où l'on devait s'aviser de frelater les vieilles pierres comme les vieux vins. Thank you very much, Lola Mom, for this reading. Now we're moving on to South America with Paz Núñez Reguero, the chief curator in charge of the Heritage Unity for the Americas collection at the Musée du Quai Branly, Jacques Chirac. She will speak of the construction techniques that can be observed on the Machu Picchu site. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to be here this morning to speak of the work on stone in, during the Inca period, especially the Arca, Inca architecture with exceptional uh, achievements by these ancient civilizations. So it is uh, indeed a very different style from which was presented earlier by my colleague. I will also talk about stone constructions uh, which uh, still exist today. Among these Inca uh, stone constructions, the site of Machu Picchu was built in the 15th century uh, near Cusco. It is an exceptional uh, construction. What I want to present to you today is also a general overview of how Incas uh, saw this architecture so you can understand the political value and ritual value of this very particular site. Through uh, this, uh, with this lecture, I want to show you how Inca sovereigns uh, wanted uh, to uh, convey uh, meanings with stone, a message of authority and also of power. I will start, uh, I will divide my lecture in three parts. I will talk about the genesis of the Inca Empire and the fundamental role of these uh, stone constructions in the uh, Inca colonizing uh, project. I will present this huge 
Inca construction to show you the exceptional work on stone. And also, I will show you how these, uh, how these buildings uh, should be perceived. And this will allow us to look at the Machu Picchu site, which embodies uh, uh, the political ideology and religious ideology of the Inca sovereign. So some introductory remarks on the context. We are in the 15th century in the central Andean. Andeans. The Inca Empire was very much present in less than 70 years, a very uh, small uh, period of time became the largest uh, empire in, the, uh, in this region. So you see this empire all along the Andean Cordillera, these high uh, uh, lands they also conquered the coastal areas and the Amazonian uh, uh, side. This uh, stretches uh, when the conquistadores from Spain arrived in the 15th century. It stretches uh, on more than 5,000 kilometers uh, from the north of Quito in Ecuador to the city of Santiago de Chile. It covers a uh, geographical space which is very fragmented, a mosaic uh, uh, in terms of languages, uh, tribes, ethnic tribes with a population uh, uh, of 10, um, 12 million inhabitants. The supreme power was detained by uh, the Sapa Inca, the supreme uh, leader. He was considered as a half god. He was supposed to be the son of the sun. He was uh, thus perceived as a mediator between the holy world and the profane world. He was the, he's the state leader and the main stakeholder in all the public ceremonies uh, uh, in, uh, related to agriculture, the cult of uh, the worship of the sun, which was the state religion. So the Inca regulates re the relationship with the capital. Cusco, where he's established, and the different ethnic groups from the Andean region under his authority. And these relations are managed by a matrimonial alliance uh, policy. So through these, this network, uh, 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 family network, uh, uh, this led to a very uh, efficient policy and infrastructure. Through this, the Inca will control this vast territory, which is based on a social equilibrium where reciprocity uh, and the distribution of riches between the capital and the uh, submitted populations is uh, fundamental indeed. Here you see a table from uh, the uh, 12, uh, 15th century. You see the lineage of Inca uh, sovereigns as, is, as it was told to the Spanish conquistadores. You had 14 sovereigns uh, from an original uh, couple, Manco pa Patak and Mama Waco, his wife, who, emer who emerged from Pacarimbo and who established in the, themselves in the region of Cusco to establish the first village. So it's a long lineage, indeed, a long genealogy. The first historical Inca is the ninth sovereign, Inca Tapaki, Pachacuti, also known as Pachacuti, under his authority, the Inca expansion will start from 1450. In this table, you can all see the last sovereign of this lineage, lineage Atahualpa. He was captured in 1532 by Francisco Pizarro, which marked the end of the Inca Empire. So this is an empire which was quite brief, as you can see. If you look at the history, the multi-millenary uh, history of pre-Hispanic uh, cultures, but with their uh, accomplishments and their very efficient uh, uh, governance system, they are very much admired still today. In this very standardized Inca administration, 
the Inca state will impose a standardization in the Andean region, which will be expressed through the creation, artistic creation, and stone architecture, which will be put at the service of uh, the message of authority that the sovereign wants to convey to uh, uh, establish his control over this vast territory. As I was saying, if we follow the oral traditions of the Inca, the Cusco capital was uh, founded by the first uh, mythical sovereign, Manco Capac. During the 13th, 14th century, this village will acquire a regional, a growing regional importance. And uh, at, during the mid 15th century, they will win an important battle with the rivals of the Incas, the Champas. And this will prevent the Inca uh, uh, expansion. So this uh, uh, marks uh, uh, part of the uh, Pachacuti uh, uh, leadership, which will lead to the creation of Machu Picchu. From this capital, you have the uh, different roads uh, uh, of the empire. Tawan Tinsuyu, these four areas, as you can see on the map here, and on the various illustrations, you have this is from a columnist of the end of the 15th century, the son of an Inca princess. These two illustrations uh, uh, give you an idea of how the Inca perceived the empire. The first illustration shows five urban centers represented by a series of stone constructions. Uh, Cusco is in the middle with the four different areas uh, spreading across the territory. The other illustration is an allegory of the empire. The, the Inca sovereign is in its center. That's, that is uh, Cusco. Another of his names uh, is carried by four bearers who embody these four uh, suyu, these four main roads, uh, who wear the very typical uh, clothing of uh, these uh, uh, different uh, populations, anti suyu, kunti suyu, kola suyu, and chincha uh, isuyu. So this is a very centralized way to see power with Cusco uh, in the middle um, and Cusco also being the sovereign. Cusco is in the middle of this empire, at the very heart of the empire. It's the holy uh, city where you have the religious power, the political power, and Pachacuti, the sovereign, rebuilt entirely the capital in the middle of the 15th century when the Inca expansion started. He started a very ambitious program to uh, remodel uh, uh, the uh, public uh, um, area. You have in irrigation channels agricultural ter terraces, so the center of Cusco was quite narrow and was uh, uh, nestled uh, in the center which was delimited by two rivers which crisscrossed the center of the city. And the main element of this center of Cusco was a main square where you had most of the most the, the political and community demonstrations, uh, events. And uh, from there, the four main roads of the, uh, um, the empire uh, uh, s started. So the political and economical uh, role of this empire still plays a role today. The descendants of each lineage uh, create uh, the panacas, uh, the family network, which have to keep the mummies of their ancestors. Uh, and they should perceive also the different levy levies to which the populations are submitted. So a sovereign has to establish new domains which belong to him to allow the survival of uh, the panaca who will protect their bodies and so forth. Some of the colonial texts suggest that the center of Cusco was reorganized by Pachacuti to uh, give the, it the shape of a puma. The lower part of the city, you see the uh, feline uh, outline and you have the different rivers and the hill on the to the north 
corresponds to the head of uh, and the mouth of the feline. It's a symbol of authority, the puma. Uh, uh, it has been the case for a very long time in the this region, and this materializes materializes the power uh, of the sovereign and the memory of his predecessors. So it's very imposing indeed. Uh, there were 15 to 20,000 inhabitants when the Spanish uh, uh, conquerors arrived. And you have 100,000 inhabitants all around the city. So the Spanish were very much impressed by the architectural quality of the city, its cleanliness and its structure. This uh, city offers a very uh, uniform aspect. Most of the buildings were built in stone and don't have any uh, levels or floors. They have thatched roofs, so the general overview is that of homogeneity. You uh, see that there are changes in terms of the use of the stone, which and the result is very harmonious. It has great aesthetic quality that it confers to the whole uh, city. So the Spanish arrived in 1534. They destroyed some of the buildings, but reused some of them. Uh, but they kept the basis, uh, the very foundations of the original architecture. This is what allows us to study today. You see a view of, the, uh, of Cusco today, and you see the main square of the city, Plaza de Armas, the square of the weapons. Uh, uh, which is the uh, seat of um, religious um, events and uh, other events. Within this capital city, and more generally in the way that Inca thought, architecture was a way, uh, a privileged way of uh, express, expressing uh, uh, power and the greatness of the Inca Empire. So these constructions have very uh, um, plain uh, um, volumes, but the topography will give movement to these constructions uh, uh, laid out all around the city. Here you have a very famous example of Inca constructions uh, that are still preserved in the, in the city of Cusco, the temple of Coricancha meaning the golden uh, lock, which is the largest, the most important of the empire and of the capital. This temple was uh, set on a natural promontory and was dedicated to the sun uh, god. It is spectacular, which really stands out uh, next to other palaces. Uh, it is very imposing. You have a curved wall that you can see on this picture on the left. And this uh, curved wall is very rare in Inca architecture, which in general is quite, is rather geometrical with more lines, rectangular shapes. So this uh, temple, this important temple, will be renovated by Pachacuti several times. And this building will impress the most uh, conquistadores, the conquerors, Spanish conquerors, who refer to this uh, building uh, very often. Uh, here you have a, uh, an image of that temple on the right. It was surrounded by a mural. Here I am, I am co quoting one of the Spanish conquerors. Some stones were very large and superb. They had no mix of earth or lime, but also the concrete with which they were used to cover their buildings. The stone are so well cut that there is no apparent sim sem cement or seals. In this complex, uh, uh, you had six temples dedicated to several gods, Inti the sun, which was represented by a large gold um, disc, as you can see on the right uh, uh, picture here. Also a god uh, for stars, the moon, and, uh, uh, um, and lightning. In these temples, you had the main ceremonies uh, related to the Inca sovereigns, weddings, uh, 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 funerals, for example. 
So today we have a very uh, fragmented uh, uh, view of that original building. It was partly destroyed destroyed by the Spanish from 1534 uh, uh, as they built the uh, congregation of the Dominicans. So you see the current church of the Dominicans on top of the uh, uh, Inca foundations. And uh, la originally, there was a golden cornice. You had uh, uh, statues uh, which were gilded with uh, gold or precious metals and what is very what was very impressive in that uh, space was the garden close to the temple which presented a series of human animal and plant uh, 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 f figures uh, in gold or um, and or silver in their original scale, and the Spanish uh, uh, melted all of those precious metals. So obviously what we can find today is very different from what the Inca uh, uh, built and what the Spanish saw upon their arrival. So these uh, constructions are, are, are being established all over the city center, but to establish the power, they will create other centers, administrative centers, uh, uh, um, worship uh, centers, uh, which will become regional capital cities. Uh, they are uh, located four or five days of walk, uh, one from another, built in stones. That's the very DNA of the Inca uh, uh, builders. And they always have a main square, which uh, uh, is the seat of most of the events. And this is where all the inhabitants of the province, of the region, come to a feast uh, uh, around the Inca and to thank him for his uh, benevol benevolence. You have different resting places also and a sun temple, part of these uh, constructions, and the house of chosen women, where you had the recluse women who were dedicated to worship the sun and who also con conducted several uh, um, creations, textile uh, pieces, and they also uh, made the corn-based uh, beer, which was very important for all the community celebrations. You have an example here of uh, of one Copampa, which is established uh, at uh, 3,000 meters of uh, altitude, Chinchai Suyuf. This city is organized around a large uh, uh, square of uh, 500 times 300 square meters, and you had a large pr central platform that you can find in other cities, uh, Ushnu. And this is where the different uh, uh, ceremonies, religious ceremonies, were organized. Uh, you, the city was divided in different neighborhoods, a side stretching on two kilometers, which included 400 uh, buildings. This site was completely abandoned upon the fall of the Inca Empire, and which was uh, very well preserved indeed. Another uh, exceptional uh, creation in terms of stone architecture was the large uh, road network which was set up. I talked about the administrative uh, network, which is related by the Royal Road, the Capac Nyan in Quechua. And this uh, uh, network was started by Pachacuti and then renovated with each new sovereign as the empire was expanding. So this is one of the most exceptional uh, creation of the Incas in less than one century, 70 years. Uh, created uh, uh, 45,000 kilometers of stones uh, with draining systems uh, and which allowed these constructions to be kept in a very good condition. With this network of roads, uh, you have a flow of people and goods in a region that is uh, uh, very difficult to access in parts. Thanks to this road network, 
uh, uh, the Spanish conquerors uh, were, uh, could easily uh, move around along this road. Uh, every 15 to 25 kilometers, you had the uh, tambos, those small structures you can see on the picture. Uh, um, these were places to uh, get a shelter and to rest. And uh, they were along the roads uh, 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 which were used to pass on information very quickly. One message could reach, uh, could leave Lima uh, by the coast uh, and reach uh, uh, its destination in three days. Uh, for a coverage of 750 kilometers. This shows how the Inca structures were uh, very uh, important for the development of the Inca empire. So stone constructions were a way to control the territory, to move around very quickly for goods, for people, for the army also, and for the people working for the empire. So this road network is an architectural express expression which is pervasive uh, throughout the Inca Empire. And this ubiquity, you can still feel it today when you travel today, not only in Peru, but if you travel uh, across the region, you have this road network that you can see almost everywhere, as these agricultural terraces that you can see on the screen here, and that can be seen uh, on uh, the sides of the mountains. Uh, these agricultural terraces are also a feat in terms of architecture for the Inca Empire. These terraces uh, built on a large scale, um, a allowed to, ha to gain more arable land in a very um, mountainous region and uh, different uh, crops could be uh, uh, cultivated such as corn which was used to feed the population but also to make beer. There is a series of uh, um, canals uh, 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 draining system that was very efficient to water these uh, terraces uh, and it is incredible to see the condition of those spaces today. Here you see the agricultural terraces of the Pisac Royal uh, Territory which is another domain which belonged to Pachacuti and which is located 30 kilometers away from Cusco. You can also see on these terraces the way they are laid out across the territory, a research, aesthetical, uh, aesthetic research, uh, which is quite uh, obvious. Uh, there is the idea of showing the power uh, uh, over, the, over nature and over the mountain, which could be fashioned as they wish to. This large network of terraces, which is irrigated on the hillside, show uh, uh, the ideal of, uh, in terms of productivity uh, for the Incas, but also their architectural aesthetics. And it reflects this uh, clout of the Inca sovereign on a large territory. So the Inca built um, various buildings and they use stones as their material of choice, um, mostly in the mountains, as opposed to coastal populations that mostly used adobe. So in the mountains, you have the constructions made of cut stone with no mortar. And the most uh, typical example is the Sextai woman um, site. It's just above Cusco in the mountains. That's a monumental construction in which you can find three uh, walls <coughs> made of stones with an impressive size, some of them being more than three meters in height. But because of the monumental aspect of these walls, the Spanish interpreted this as being a fortress. And this site was looted and used as a quarry as of the conquista. Therefore, the interpretation of this site is difficult today. We believe it was more a religious 
building that was uh, used by inhabitants in Cusco. Okay, so now let me tell you more about the work on stone in architecture in the days of the Incas. So before I do that, I wanted to say a few words about labor, which is absolutely crucial to build these uh, stone monuments and buildings. And from an economic perspective, the Inca kingdom is characterized by the fact that they do not uh, uh, get money from the people, but they get labor days. So the population takes care of the land, of herds, they build roads and uh, agricultural infrastructures. This is what we call the mita, which means shifts in Quechua. And this meter, can, this shift you owe to the, the Inca, the time you owe to the Inca can be up to three months. And in return, the Inca provides safe security through an army. So that's a very centralized uh, organization, and everything is governed by the Inca state. And it's based on reciprocity, sharing, and redistribution of resources in exchange for this labor that the population was um, making available to the Inca state and to the Inca himself. So stone is used. Well, it's cut to assemble the blocks. So three types of um, stones, porphyrium and desert and limestone, and there is no uh, iron tools which are used, uh, or when they are, it's in a very limited fashion. So these large stone blocks are, are cut with um, pebbles, which are used as hammers. Each block of stone can weigh several tons. They are shaped thanks to these hammers made of pebbles, then the blocks are pulled by arm using pulleys uh, all the way to the construction site where they are assembled. The cutting and laying of blocks is so accurate that they don't need any mortar. Finishing is done with the sanding equipment in order to obtain an extremely uh, smooth and refined surface. So here you can see the way these blocks can be cut in different ways. Um, large parts of buildings used by the Inca government uh, are built from rectangular stones, but there are many other types of shapes which are used for the construction of prestigious buildings. And the larger the number of sites on these blocks, the more complex the assembly. So most of the time, the stones in these uh, buildings can be shaped as cushions. So the illusion, you see here to the right, you have an illusion of, of uh, this uh, stone being a bit swollen. But that's uh, an aesthetic effect that's obtained by the way they assemble the, the blocks. And in Saxoriamen, as you can see on the screen to the left, Inca masons placed a larger stone in the lower part of the wall to create a weight visual effect to give an impression of high uh, sturdiness. And then the other stones were carved in cushion style to give it this swollen effect. And that's an illusion to give the illusion of gravity. This feature along with the fact that walls are bent towards the inside, according to Inca standards, give uh, an illusion which makes uh, the walls look even more beautiful than they are. Another example on the screen, which is um, quite typical of uh, the aesthetic uh, concern when assembling the stones, uh, you have the uh, stone with 12 angles that was used, 
that was uh, laid in, in the walls of the former Inca emperor uh, Akuso. So that's a time-consuming and meticulous process that consisted in laying, then cutting, adjusting, and relaying the blocks, and they would fit exactly one with the other. And the construction of a large wall could uh, last uh, more than a year. The basic element in Inca uh, construction and town planning is a set of rectangular uh, buildings, one room, one story, with a thatched roof, all arranged around a courtyard. This is what they call a cancha, an enclosure, and it's uh, surrounded by uh, a wall with uh, one or two doors to protect the intimacy of life behind the wall. This structure can be used for simple lodgings, but also for temples and palaces. Temples and palaces being perceived as the houses of the gods. The representation you can see here on screen is that of the Kolekancha temple, one of the most significant buildings in the empire. And as you can see, the, the shapes of the buildings are quite simple. Then it's the quality of the work uh, uh, of the masons, of the stone cutters, and the presence of this curvy uh, wall and the presence of precious metals that give this uh, uh, building its prestige and it's not its, or its uh, overall layout. So that's one of the um, most important feature in Inca construction. So you have stone construction, trapeze-shaped uh, openings and uh, high slope in the uh, roofing uh, system. That's another view of the remaining structures for the Colocante um, temple. That's one of the buildings that was built in the main courtyard. So you see all these shapes which are quite typical of Inca I infrastructure. You have these uh, walls that are slightly bent inward, so the slope is four to six um, degrees. You have uh, doors, windows, and niche which are trapeze shaped. That's also quite typical. And you can see how the different blocks of stones are assembled, and that's a very precise. Despite this very simple aspect, this system of um, fitting the stones together make the building very resistant and very sturdy. And they did resist since they were uh, built. They've been, they were built more than five centuries ago. And don't forget this region has lots of earthquakes. So this uh, technique was well adapted to the Endine um, landscape. So when you walked in Inca cities, you had a feeling of long streets with buildings uh, that uh, you couldn't see through, so you couldn't see life. They were Buildings were protected by walls. You can see here uh, Aklawasi. This is the place where the recluse uh, women, the f women dedicated to the um, to worshiping the sun, and they had very important missions. They were producing textile. They were producing a corn beer that was used uh, during the festivities and for all ceremonies uh, dedicated to the sun. And to the right, you have the remains of the walls of uh, the palace of the very last Inca king who died in 1528, just before uh, the Spanish uh, arrived in the country. So these walls are very important. And you can see the size of the stone blocks that were used for these two structures. And you see the size is very different, but that gives a lot of, um, it gives a feeling of movement to these buildings, which are all built according to the same standards and all using stones. 
So now I'd like to say a few words about uh, the Machu Picchu royal uh, site. And the first thing I wanted to clarify is that Machu Picchu is a royal uh, estate. It's kind of the countryside estate of the Inca sovereign. All nobilities have these countryside mansions around the capital city where they stay it during the winter season. The favorite area for the building of these countryside mansions is the valley of the Wilkenotta uh, River, north of Cusco, which is quite close to the capital city, but at a lower height in the mountain and therefore has a milder climate during the winter. In this region, there is a whole series of uh, hunting grounds and forests that are the property of the sovereign. Today, we have identified 18 of these around Cusco, the largest being that of Machu Picchu. As I said, this estate was built by Pachacuti, and you probably understand that this Inca, this sovereign, was a great builder and he used stones as a means to communicate and establish his authority over the Tawansesuyo, the, the river. Machu Picchu is located close enough from Cusco because you could go back to Cusco th in three or four days, just walking. So this uh, site, this estate was created by Pachacuti. Uh, it housed the royal family after the passing of Pachacuti. And during the conquista, it was uh, forgotten and was rediscovered in 1911 by Hiram Hingen, the American explorer. This is a site located at 2,430 meters in height in an outstanding, a stunning uh, mountainous uh, area in a tropical forest. So as I said, it's located in a, in a region which is m much warmer and humid than Cusco. And this is where Pachacuti went during the winter time along with his family. And he would spend two to three months there. That's a stunning and outstanding site that was most probably selected for its beauty and for the power that emanate from the mountains around. Very often in the morning you have fog that comes from the river. And once the fog dissipates, the site and its environment appear in their full splendor and magnificence. The site is not very large. It's just one kilometer in length. But it includes 200 um, buildings. And most probably only 700 people could stay there. So just a royal family and part of the court could uh, stay, he stay there. But most servants and soldiers had to live in camps around the estate. So only the elite, the members of the elite and the sovereign live in what we call canchas, so the uh, stone buildings, whereas the servants l live in small rectangular buildings outside uh, the, uh, the walls. One element I've not mentioned enough, I believe, but you see that all these buildings are very small. Why? Well, because Incas spent most of their days outside and the buildings were used for rituals and to sleep at night, and that was it. Most of their activities during the day would take place in the courtyard of these kenchas 
or in the main square, which in Machu Picchu, as you can see, is a very large uh, city square because it covers uh, almost one third of the overall uh, surface area of the Machu Picchu site. Machu Picchu was a site that most probably helped strengthening the links between the sovereign and the elite families in Cusco. During the month they spent in Machu Picchu, they held banquets and religious ceremonies to strengthen the links between the most powerful families in the capital city. If you can see uh, references three and four, that's the entrance to the site where you access the site. And then this is where you had the Torreon, which is one of the most important temple on the site. And then next to figure number three, to the right, you have this space that we identify as the palace of the sovereign. And then where you have the arrow that says to Awapichu, which is a mountain opposite the site. You have what we call the uh, sacred stone uh, that I will talk about a bit later. So this site is absolutely magnificent, very impressive. It's built on a very steep mountain and you have a series of terraces that were built in order to channel rainwater. Terraces were also used for agricultural purposes, but most studies that were conducted demonstrated that the surface area of these terraces was far too small for the size of the uh, site to, 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 to provide enough food for, for all the people living there. So the food most probably had to be brought from the capital city. Uh, we also found a limited number of uh, farming tools and that confirms that most probably these terraces were not used for agricultural purposes. This is another view uh, of the site from the Thau Sand and you can see the access to the site where you have this uh, uh, arrow pointing at the main stair stairways and you see the uh, size of this large uh, square where uh, people dealt with their daily business when they were residing in, in Machu Picchu. And you see that this picture also shows the surrounding mountains which had a sacred um, meaning for the Incas. Okay, sorry, I don't have a pointer, so it's a bit more difficult, but I just wanted to show you some emblematic constructions in Machu Picchu. More specifically, this round-shaped building that still complies with uh, the standards of Inca architecture. You have the round wall. This is what we think was uh, a temple. And because it's circular, it creates a direct connection with the Temple of the Sun in Cusco. So that was probably a way for Pachacuti to show this very close connection between the Temple of the Sun and this site and reassert his divine uh, power. This was built on a rock that was cut in a cave. We believe it's an allusion to the pr uh, primal or primordial cave which in which the uh, original couple was born that then gave uh, were the ancestors of all Incas. And um, outside this temple, this temple was uh, in a place where the uh, major, largest and, and most influential families were spending two or three months during the winter time. You also have this um, area for ceremonies, which was named the temple with the three windows. It's also been interpreted as a place that refers back to the primordial cave 
where the first Incas were born. And this site is described as uh, including three caves, which are represented by the three windows. And the three windows were placed at the center of the structure to give a, to, to make reference to this divine origin of Inca sovereigns. So that's once again to remind us of uh, Pachacuti's uh, status in the population. Uh, in conclusion, one uh, important thing when talking about stone cutting in the Inca Empire, they had they showed veneration for mountain tops in the region, and because of that, they very often included the surrounding landscape in their site. So in many of the sites around Cusco, Inca sovereigns erected stone slabs around large open spaces, and the cutting was uh, imitating the mountains behind. There are six of these stones in Machu Picchu, and there are others which are very well known in other sites that Pachacuti frequented. So that um, leads us to believe that uh, he was at the origin of these uh, other sites. And this uh, monolith called the sacred stone, you see a picture and a sketch here, that's a stone that's uh, 3.7 meters in height and 8.7 meters in width. And it was laid on a cut stone base, which is 10 meters in width. So this work was certainly extremely complex. And you see how the contour of the monolith was carved and cut to replicate the shape of the mountain just behind, the uh, Manantin mountain, which is just behind, you can see it. And this mountain was venerated by the Incas because it's the highest one in the region with an altitude of 4,300 meters. This mountain was considered as a protector and its representation as a monolith made it possible to include this uh, this representation within the Inca village. So that's probably the reincarnation of the Yanantin mountain. This sacred stone showed the relationship between the powerful mountain and the royal estate, once again giving a great importance to Machu Picchu and therefore a great importance to Pachacutin. As a conclusion, one last picture of this outstanding site, which is stunning to all visitors and which was listed on the list of um, World Heritage by UNESCO. And that's um, a site that uh, most probably amazed uh, Inca visitors who came to the site, they were stunned by this spectacular landscape and by seeing Machu Picchu emerging from the uh, tropical forest. When they discovered the wall made of stones, these visitors certainly became aware that they were entering the surreal kingdom of the sun of the sun. Incas gave divine statute to those who could tame the mountains. And in Machu Picchu, all those buildings gave Pachacuti the status of somebody who could tame wild stones and recreate a mountain. So it's this civilize, civilizing mission of the Inca, who can recreate mountains the way he wants. This is the main message that uh, was given by the, by the Machu Picchu constructions. And all this uh, bears witness of the authority of the, of the sovereign over the landscape. The stone architecture creates a clear distinction between the wilderness of the Andes 
and the uh, royal estates where uh, the voilà, culture of Machu Picchu grew. Thank you for your attention. In order to prepare for his course at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, Hippolytaine set out on a trip to Italy in 1864. In the spring of that year, he was in Rome in the Cornaro Chapel of the Church of Santa Maria della Vittoria. Lola Moom will narrate his description of the ecstasy of Saint Teresa, one of Bernini's masterpieces sculpted between 1647 and 1652. Lola, you have the floor. Nous sommes revenus par Santa Maria de la Vittoria pour voir la Sainte Thérèse du Bernin. Elle est adorable, couchée, évanouie d'amour, les mains, les pieds nus pendants, les yeux demi-clos, elle s'est laissée tomber de bonheur et d'extase. Son visage est maigri, mais combien noble c'est la vraie grande dame qui a séché dans les feux, dans les larmes, en attendant celui qu'elle aime. Jusqu'aux draperies tortillées, jusqu'à l'alanguissement des mains défaillantes, jusqu'au soupir qui meurt sur ses lèvres entrouvertes, il n'y a rien en elle ni autour d'elle qui n'exprime l'angoisse voluptueuse et le divin élancement de son transport. On ne peut pas rendre avec des mots une attitude si enivrée et si touchante. Renversée sur le dos, elle se pâme, tout son être se dissout. Le moment poignant arrive, elle gémit. C'est son dernier gémissement. La sensation est trop forte. L'ange, cependant, a un jeune page de 14 ans en légère tunique. La poitrine découverte jusqu'au dessous du sein arrive gracieux, aimable. C'est le plus joli page de grand seigneur qui vient faire le bonheur d'une vassale trop tendre. Un sourire demi-complaisant, demi-malin, creuse des fossettes dans ses fraises joues luisantes. Sa flèche d'or à la main indique le tressaillement délicieux et terrible dont il va secouer tous les nerfs de ce corps charmant, ardent, qui s'étale devant sa main. On n'a jamais fait de roman si séduisant, si tendre. Ce Bernin, qui me semblait si ridicule à Saint-Pierre, a trouvé ici la sculpture moderne, toute fondée sur l'expression. Et pour achever, il a disposé le jour de manière à verser sur ce délicat visage pâle une illumination qui semble celle de la flamme intérieure, en sorte qu'à travers le marbre transfiguré qui palpite, on voit luire comme une lampe l'âme inondée de félicité et de ravissement. Thank you very much, Lola. Let us go back a century and analyze another masterpiece in the company of Cristina Dicini Lucina. Sorry if I mispronounced your name. Says the speaker, Cristina is an art historian, honorary professor at the University of Florence and one of the former specialists of Michelangelo, the sculptor. So now let us take a look uh, take a look with her at the creation of the Pietà kept in the Vatican. Christina, the floor is yours. Michelangelo's Buon Buonarroti's Pietà, made of marble, appeared in Rome in 1500 in the Chapel of the Kings of France, dedicated to Saint Petronia at Saint Peter's Basilica. It immediately received the admiration reserved for supreme masterpieces, thus establishing the fame of its creator while still young, at the age of 25. Michelangelo was born in 1475 in Caprese, in Tuscany, in what is now known as the province of Arezzo, in the Florentine domain where his father, Ludovica, was Podesta, or chief magistrate of the city. Ludovico's father, was, who belonged to a once mighty petty nobility, 
tried to prevent Michelangelo from following his passion for art. He could not bring himself to imagine his son as a manual laborer, laborer as in this portrait by Giuliano Bugiardini. But to no avail could he discourage his son. Michelangelo had an excellent precocious education in art, for at the age of 15, he was admitted to the San Marco Garden owned by the Medici family. Here you have a former, an ancient image of this garden and now a present day image of that uh, garden where some of the trees are still kept. Lorenzo de Medici, also known as the Magnificent, he was the uh, secret lord of Florence, welcomed promising young men into the garden to have them copy the marbles of antiquity. They also learned sculpture under the guidance of Bertoldo di Giovanni, the author of this bronze battle. Bertoldo di Giovanni was the last pupil, pupil of the great Donatello. The biographers Giorgio Vasari in 1550 and Ascanio Condivi in 1553 reported the story of the old faun, Michelangelo, when Lorenzo the Magnificent pointed out to him that he had made a mistake in uh, showing the old faun with all of his teeth, because old people lose their teeth, immediately he removed one of those teeth. And the episode was depicted among the glories of the Medici a century and, uh, and a half later, as you can see it on this fresco, which is in the Pitti Palace in Florence. In the garden, Michelangelo sculpted the Madonna della Scala in marble as a tribute to Donatello, working the scale and the relief with a lot of finesse. And this, thanks to the technique known as tiacciato in Florentine, which corresponds to the modern Italian schiacciato, which means to crush. It was around 1490, and Michelangelo was 15 years old at the time. The other early masterpiece is the Battle of the Centaurs and Lapiths, sculpted in 1491-92, still in the garden. The mythological topic was suggested by the poet Agnolo Poliziano. The inspiration came from ancient sarcophagi and the Battle of Bertoldo di Giovanni. With the death of Lorenzo the Magnificent in 1492, the garden was disbanded. Michelangelo's great career began, however, with a forgery. Lorenzo de Medici, cousin of the Magnificent, advised him to, quote unquote, make appear older and to sell as an excavation piece a sleeping uh, cherub. He had sculpted himself, probably similar to an ancient one that can now be seen in the Uffizi in Florence. As the fraud was discovered, Michelangelo was summoned to Rome by Cardinal Riario, who wanted his money back since he had bought it from him. But the banker of the Cardinal Jacobo Galli had him sculpt a Bacchus with satyr. In the mid 16th century, we find it represented. Here you see an image from, uh, from this re of this representation. We find also this represented as an antique statue in the Giardino Galli. Also for Galli, Michelangelo sculpted a god of love identified with the archer in the Service Culturel de l'Ambassade de France on the Fifth Avenue in New York and currently at the Metro Metropolitan Museum of Art. Also in Rome came his first major opportunity. Cardinal Jean de Biller de la Grola ordered him a Pieta for the Chapel of the Kings of France dedicated to Saint Petronia at Saint Peter's Basilica, which was later destroyed. Here you see this structure, which is circular, which can be found on this stamp on the right of the slide, this print. The statue 
statutory group is supposed to represent the dead Christ on the knees of the Madonna, seated on a rock of the Calvary. This iconography is highlighted by the German compound word Vespebild. It is a serene image, evocative of the twilight hour and also of solitary mourning. This Vesper build iconography is quite common in northern European U regions. Here is an example on this uh, slide, uh, which may, find, may be found in Cracovia. It is also found within the legacy of Byzantine painting, as in this moving icon of Cretan Venetian art, which is kept in the Petit Palais here in Paris. The image is less common in Italy, yet there is no shortage of examples in 15th century Ferrara painting, which Michelangelo was able to see and to appreciate on his trip to Ferrara and to Venice in 1494, slightly before he was asked to make the Pieta in Florence. In Florence still, this uh, inner church, this lamentation painted by the famous Pietro Perugino in 1483-85 with the body of Christ on the knees of the Madonna. This was exhibited in a church. Michelangelo decided to personally supervise the extraction of the marble block, which was quite unusual at the time. In the autumn of 1497, he went to Carrara while the cardinal wrote to the elders of Luca to help him in his dealings with the lord of Carrara, the Marquis Alberico Malaspina of Fosdinovo. Since Roman times, the, mess, the best marbles were extracted from quarries in the Torano Basin. From the 14th century, the quarries were looked after by, uh, were operated by quarrymen united in the powerful guild known as Ars Marmoris, the art of marble. The 19th century views accompanying a geology textbook show the quarries and their upkeep using traditional pre-industrial methods, which are not very different from those of the antiquity. For the Pieta, the chosen quarry was Polvaccio, that of Polvaccio, which is the Michelangelo quarry. It is known as the Michelangelo quarry today. It was an uncomfortable and uphill quarry, but suitable for producing blocks of pure statutory, statuary marble of memorable perfection, only with rare veins of emery. As this drawing shows, one among many of its kind, Michelangelo carefully drew the outlines of marble blocks. His mark was three intertwined circles, as you may see there. The Academia del Disegno, the Academy of Drawing, was founded in 1563, and they used those three intertwined circles as the logo, but they turned them into three garlands. That's uh, the very emblem that they still carry today. The marble blocks were brought to the marina in Avenza at great risk and effort. And from there, they were shipped to Civita Vecchia. Going up the river Tiber, they landed in Rome at the port of Ripa Grande. Michelangelo made use of all the sculptor's tools of different sizes for cutting and striking the stone. He was very demanding and personally supervised the manufacture. Studies conducted on marble statues from 1504 to 1506, slightly after making the Pieta, have allowed to reveal which tools were used through the different working traces 
from rustic rough to polished aspects. The sequence of the workings has made it possible to reconstruct his working method with the attack on the block from an edge. Michelangelo saw the figure inside the block and would then, as he would say himself, remove he would remove the superfluous material to free the stone. In addition to the tools of the sculptor, Michelangelo also used the, those of the stonemason. His family had a house in Settignano, near Florence, where the Pietra Serena, the serene stone, was used extensively. It's a blue-gray sandstone, and this was how the artist came into contact very quickly with stonemasons. These obvious traces of workmanship are typical of the unfinished aspect of the piece. Michelangelo, in fact, left many statues unfinished at different stages. And even today, critics debate whether the unfinished aspect of his works represented a deliberate interruption or was caused by external adverse circumstances such as overwork or travel. No such obvious traces of marble working are visible on the Pieta, as the figures and draperies are polished to extreme perfection. The block of stone dis destined for the Pieta was not without flaws, yet it was of the highest quality ever seen in Rome in the 15th century. The size of the block was also exceptional, and this enabled the artist to meet the unprecedented challenge of obtaining two full-size figures from it without adding any pieces. The shape of the block conditioned the arrangement of the volumes, allowing a wide horizontal development against a limited depth. Just look at the lateral expansion of Mary's uh, garments. An esteemed photographer of our time, Aurelio Amendola, is a great interpreter of Michelangelo's sculpture. In 2014, he pro produced a photographic campaign of the Vatican Pieta. Here you can see some of his shots with commentary sentences commentary by Condivia and Vasari. I made the most holy virgin mother of God in comparison to her much younger son, as Michelangelo said, uh, explaining that her purity kept her young. Dante Alighieri had called Mary the daughter of her son. Among the beautiful things that are there, beyond her divine garments, we see the dead Christ. There is a very gentle look on his face, uh, as uh, expressed by Giorgio Vasari in his Vita di Michelangelo of 1550 and 1568, the life of Michelangelo. You see a concordance in the muscles of the arms and in those of the body and legs, as Vasari commented on. And let no one think of the beauty of the limbs and the artifice of the body to see a naked man so divine, nor a dead man who looks more like the dead man than the dead man, again, a court of Vasari. Our Lady with her dead child in her lap, said Kundivi. The Madonna's left arm represents a daring technical challenge as it produ pr protrudes into the void and is therefore exposed and fragile. You may also notice that the fingers are separated one from another. They are not uh, brought together, but small pieces of marbles that sculptors call bridges. Vasari also comments on the wrists and the veins, which are very refined, the divine garments. 
departing from his own style of lucid and precise writing, Vasari comments on the Pieta in a confused manner, as if he was himself in a state of moved intoxication. In contrast to the beautifully polished surfaces of the figures, the stone seat and rock base are much more rough looking, rudimentary, imitating the natural stone. On the belt across the Madonna's breast is, can be seen the only signature ever affixed by the artist. Michael Angelus Bonarotus Florentinus Facebat, his signature. According to Vasari, he added his signature after hearing a guide among the pilgrims in St. Peter's attributing the Pieta to another sculptor the Lombard Cristofano Solari. Michelangelo would return to sculpt the Pieta as an old man in an entirely different spiritual state of mind. In the Bandini of Florence Pieta, he depicts himself as the succoring Nicodemus embracing the group in sorrow. Also in the Rondanini or Milan Pieta, which he worked on until the eve of his death in 1564, he annihilated the beauty of the body to communicate the sacrifice of the Redeemer and the intense suffering of the mother. Never again in his sculpture would Michelangelo want to recreate the elaborate finesse of the Vatican Pieta a manifest of his youthful quest for beauty through technical perfection. Let us conclude with Vasari's words of astonished admiration, and I quote, certainly it is a miracle that a stone without any specific form to begin with has ever been reduced to that perfection which nature with difficulty forms in the flesh, end of quote. The artist here has surpassed even the creative power of nature. Thank you very much for your attention. So, we are now going to listen to Stefan Rink, an artist. He's going to tell us about his work and we want to thank him. He made it all the way from Berlin to tell us about his work. Good morning. Well, first, thanks for inviting me and for giving me this opportunity of uh, sharing my experience with you. So I'd like to talk about my experience with stone and I'd like to start showing you my first slides or my first pictures to tell you you about how I structure my work. So I'll talk about uh, myself first, then I'll tell you about the various stones I use, and then at the end I'd like to take you through my studio where I actually sculpt, and I, I would also like to show you pictures of a quarry uh, from my, where I source the stones I work with. So, as for myself, who am I? So, I was born in the Saar region of Germany, close to the French border. But apologies, I can't speak French. My parents were both teachers. My mother was teaching art and my father was teaching social sciences and philosophy. After school, I became an apprentice to learn how to cut stones, and I also uh, learned sculpture for a graveyard. So I uh, worked on tombstones, but also staircases, window sills, etc. The stone most present in my region is sandstone with various colors, multicolored uh, sandstone, 
Some of the sandstone we worked with was also sourced in France, by the way. This is a sandstone with a very uh, fine granulometry, very fine grained. By the way, there are two types of uh, uh, sandstones I worked on back in the days. One kind of rough, which includes quartz, and the other one, which is fine grain uh, with uh, silt. And uh, in the region where I live and where I was born, it's mostly rough sandstone with uh, quartz. But in France, I could source the fine grain um, sandstone. And in my work, I'd rather use uh, sandstone coming from the Vosges region in France. After I trained uh, in vocational school, I went to university to study uh, philosophy and art history. Then I continued my studies in the Fine Arts Academy in Karlsruhe and I studied under Babincourt and during my studies I worked on various installations with the use of videos, latex, uh, cloth, uh, silk printing. Then I taught, but I came back to stones. Okay, I realized that was a bit boring. Uh, it was just my resume, so let me talk about stones. To me, every single stone has its own language. Every single stone has its own aura. And therefore, I need to adapt my work to the stone. So, I'd like to tell you more about limestone now. Limestone is a sedimentary uh, rock. You find deposits in on the coastline, so you can find small animals or shells in the stone. So here is a sculpture made of uh, this type of stone, which was sourced in Italy, in the Puglia, uh, near Lecce. And this is a stone that you can sculpt and cut easily. It's a soft stone, not as hard as others. But it hardens over time when it's uh, taken from a quarry. <clears throat> so when the stone is exposed to the air, it hardens. But when you just took it from the quarry, it's easier to cut and sculpt. This sculpture is 2.7 meters in height. And you can still see tr the traces of the tools that were used. What I use is a sharp iron tool. Then I also use flat irons. That's just to tell you how I worked on this sculpture. So this stone, limestone, well, I mostly worked on the eyes, on the hands. That's where I used my sharp iron tool. Another thing I'd like to say about this type of stone is that this is a material that I use for large sculptures. Why? Why be well, because this is a, a stone for which we can find very large blocks from quarries, or up until four meters in height which makes it possible for me to work on very large sculptures. 
I have kind of an archaic approach to sculpting. I love starting from my block of stone. And once I see the sculpture, once finished, I like people to still be able to see the original block. So, here is a series of sculptures that were all made from the same stone. But to me, this limestone is the perfect stone to make large sculptures. Here, I'm showing a sculpture from, made from French limestone. So this is an installation near Verdun in France. And on these two pictures, well, to the left, that's the sculpture as it came out of my studio. And to the right, the same sculpture that has been weathered after a few years in the forest. And due to the presence of, tre of trees, rain, sun, it, um, it now has a patina on the stone. So this patina could be erased with high pressure water jet and the sculpture could be cleaned, but the organization in charge of the sculpture only brushes the teeth of the sculpture on a regular basis and cleans its eyes, but that's all. The stone is quite easy to cut. And by the way, there are sculptures in Paris, and you see quite a few of them made from this very stone. Now, here is an example of other sculptures in limestone, but with different characteristics as compared to the Piedra Leccese, which is the one that I source from the Vosges Mountains. This stone is difficult to cut. It's very brittle. So you may sometimes and easily cut out pieces you didn't want to cut, especially when you work on the vertical axis very quickly you end up with a cut in with an unwanted cut in in the stone this stone is what we call uh, granite in uh, french in uh, uh, german we talk about the beige marble so de facto that's uh, a limestone stone but so this installation was made from one single stone or block i etched the stone with water and I separated the different parts of the sculpture using high pressure water jets. So you can see here, this is a sculpture, you can, you can separate the blocks individually and you can see the trace of the uh, different uh, drilling holes. The Piedra Lecese is not appropriate for to, for polishing, whereas the uh, black marble can be polished. This is a rather expensive marble. And there is another variety of stone, similar to this one, but which comes from China. And we never know whether this uh, stone comes from Belgium or China. It's a dark black stone, it, but it's very difficult. It's a wonderful stone, but very difficult to cut and, and sculpt. Here is another stone that I wanted to talk about, still limestone, but this one comes from Egypt, from Cairo. It is also called 
grey marble, but in reality it's limestone. And it's harder than marble, by the way. You can see here that this sculpture was uh, made from one single block of stone, which was very hard. This stone can be polished, and in the end, you get a, a grayish color, but you need to realize that this is not real marble, that's limestone. Now let's talk about sandstone. So back to my personal origins. When I was a young man, I started working on sandstone. This is not one of my early works, but it uh, gives me an opportunity to tell you about the stone I use. It's a beige sandstone called Wartowel in German. It's fine-grained sandstone, very fine-grained. But this doesn't mean that... That means that you don't have crystals in, in, in the sandstone. You just have very fine grains. And these are elements that I placed one next to the other in order to create a, a sculpture which I call, call a composition or a composite sculpture. So it's very simple. It's a family, a mother, father, children. And, but I can also But it's also a, a, a sculpture that has the shape of a totem. So it shows, uh, it gives a feeling of belonging, of a tribe where people feel at home. So I made this combination between various era in history from uh, contemporaneous to modernist and modern classic, etc. Then here I'm using sandstone from the forest behind where my uncle lives. So that's really from where I live. We took this um, block from this forest and you see that it's uh, there are veins of uh, brown and green in the stone. This sculpture was placed outside for a while and you see that nature started covering the sculpture and I kept it like that because I love this patina and if I were to start cleaning the sculpture it would change lots of things. Here is another totem installation in a garden. No patina yet but you can see how the uh, totem is assembled and how the various elements are combined to one another. Here is a sculpture made of red sandstone called Tulum. And if you take a close look, you'll realize that one of the specificities of sandstones as compared to limestone is that its structure is horizontal. You don't have cracks. These are not cracks. These are the traces of the various layers and deposits and therefore you can end up having some kind of veins in the stone. And it's of course, it's preferable to have a horizontal uh, deposition or layering in the stone because if it were vertical, then the risk is that water would seep in and should the temperatures go down, then it, it, the water would freeze and this would destroy the stone. This is a horizontal sculpture and it's... Uh, a uh, kind of a 
mix or chimera between a buffalo and a stegosaurus. I also use, here is another sculpture shaped as a garden bench, you can see here. So that's halfway between sculpture and urban furniture. So, but the stone is very robust, so you can use it for that purpose. So this sculpture here finds its inspiration in the Middle Ages and gargoyles, and, and many of my sculptures find their inspiration in the Barocco style or in the Middle Ages. Normally, sandstone cannot be polished. But this is an angry bird with um, where I polished the eyes and the beak. So here is what I do. I sand first, 120 millim millimeters. Then I use a, st a stone hardening material. And then I sand stone again with a finer sanding paper. And I also work on the color. Uh, and it's impossible to use uh, any sandstone to do that. You need to use a sandstone, the um, texture of which is close to wood. Here is another sculpture. The stone comes from Saint-Germain in France. And that's... Uh, um, sandstone with uh, different colors. Diabase. That's one of my favorite uh, stones. In what, during the era when this stone was uh, formed, that's a lava when volcanoes were active. And this is lava that remains stuck in the ground during the volcano eruptions. You know that in basaltic volcanoes, lava is expelled outside the volcano. But here, that's the exception. This lava was stuck, couldn't escape, and therefore it's a stone with a very high density, even higher than basalt itself. So you can polish it, and it's very easy to polish, because it's very hard. This was a tombstone. Uh, th this stone was typically used for tombstones. Then people said, well, there, aren't, there isn't any similar stone left. But actually, there is. There is some left. This stone, called diapase, was found in Germany, in the north of Frankfurt. It's a highly rural area, and this diabase can be found there. I mean, the, the, the size is small. The stone is quite high. The, the stone is very expensive, but it has an outstanding quality. It resists uh, weather and rain, and it can be polished very easily. And here, you can see a crocodile made from diabase. That was the largest diabase stone I could find. The size was, well, the length was uh, 3.9 meters, and I polished it almost entirely, except for the inside of the uh, jaws and the mouth of the crocodile. Because if I were to polish inside, it would take me an additional hour. That's the robustness of this uh, stone, just to show you that. It's an entire... All the kids from one single classroom could sit on this crocodile without it being damaged. This is a close uh, look 
a close-up on the eye, and you can see that there is a mirror effect, as you can see here. And there are parts which are not polished that reflect these grayish and greenish colors, uh, offering a beautiful con contrast with the polished part. Okay, so now let me say a few words about marble, traditional marble, and it's a Greek marble. So talking about marble, and in my experience, the grain size in marble can be very different. Marble is a stone that you find by the sea. Limestone melts because of the heat and gives these crystals. So marble is a crystalline stone and depending on the size of the crystals we can uh, cut the marble or sculpt the marble. This, in this stone, we have uh, relatively large crystals. And for the eyes and teeth, I uh, polished these parts in my sculpture. And here, on this picture, you can probably see that better. That's another sculpture. And the larger the crystals, the easier it is to uh, have uh, chips in your, in your stone, to chip your stone. It may happen that there is a crack in the marble. And if that happens, well, there is nothing you can do, really. You can't work with uh, cracked marble. There is also very fine grain marbles that uh, gives you the opportunity to uh, sculpt very fine details. So, some marbles are very fine and others have uh, rough crystals. And when you work with these rough marbles, the finished aspect is a bit like uh, a sugar coating that shines. This is a pink marble which can be found in Portugal. This is marble with um, large crystals. So. Th we can only sculpt simple sizes in order to avoid chipping the stone. Here on this picture, you can see a, a pink marble, which I polished. When polished, pink turns to sort of orangey salmon color. But you can find many different colors in marbles. Here, another sculpture made of pink marbles. So these are rather simple shapes because once again, as I said, the crystals in the marble are quite rough and quite large. A few words about quartzite. That's a very hard stone indeed. And here you have it in green which is called the Atlantis Quartzite. It's a ever so hard quartzite that you can't use iron tools. And you have to use water to cut this quartz. Because, well, you have to realize that quartz is very toxic and when you breathe dust, quartz dust, you risk developing silicose. So you have to be very careful with uh, quartzite. Now, polishing 
is made with water and only with water. And the stone is marbled, as you can see here. But it's a very heterogeneous stone. And here you have uh, a sculpture with a very basic shape. Why? Because, because of the marbling in the stone, it's difficult to work on a, on a very detailed and precise sculpture. OK, I'm now going to talk about uh, the provenance of my uh, stones. Only one example, the Etna volcano in Sicily. I was in Sicily in January this year because I wanted to work on a four meters high basalt totem. So basalt is one of the latest formed stone. So this was uh, lava that was probably expelled by the volcano quite recently as compared to other rocks. And you find it very nearby the volcano. This is a, t a four meters high totem. That was the maximum height I could get. So it's kind of a young stone, but at the same time, it's very hard and difficult to cut or sculpt. And when you work on this stone, once, you, once you've done what you wanted to do with the stone, you know that it won't change. So this um, city, in Sicily is based in a mountain and there are many sculptures in the city some by me many others by other artists and none of these sculptures has been has changed in terms of the sculpture of this of the structure of the stone now why did I go there where I could find the stone? Well, just to say on transportation, because you need to realize that a shipment of stones is something very expensive. That's why we sculptors would rather go to the stone and sculpt it in place. This is our studio, uh, my studio. So I very often work with uh, pneumatic devices. To the left you can see my traditional iron tools, so the toothed one, the sharp ones, but also chisels. And you can see that I have this uh, vacuum uh, system to suck all the dust around me. And on this picture uh, you see that I, I'm hoisting the sculpture and, and this with a, 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 a hoist, a hoisting system with pulleys. And with this simple structure, I can lift uh, weigh, weights up until three tons. This was my studio during the pandemic in Berlin, outside. I was only able to work on small sculptures then. You can also see the tools, the conventional tools that are used, iron tools, the reinforced chisels, also mallets. There are always two possibilities to uh, make a sculpture. First of all, you may do the contour of the sculpture, or you can start from one edge of the block of stone moving progressively. So these two options are possible to cut a stone, to work on a stone. 
Here you can see a picture of uh, our studio with two of my assistants. This was in Italy, by the way. You can see the sheer size of the stone, this block of stone which hasn't been cut yet. We wanted to cut this stone on site and you will see the sculpture that came out of that studio. This is the achieved, uh, the, the complete piece which will mark the end of my presentation. So here you see the sculpture, uh, the final piece loaded onto the truck and you can see a small film of uh, the loading operation of that uh, sculpture with a gantry uh, crane with different uh, hoists to raise it and to lift it onto the truck. This is a 13-ton sculpture. The grain was only supposed to lift 8 tons, but we were lucky to be able to lift it. However, I hope I didn't bore you with my presentation. If there are any questions, I am available and I will be delighted to do so. Thank you. Nous arrivons à la fin et avant de vous laisser avec une note musicale. We are reaching the end of this morning session before parting with music. Olivier Fournier, the president of the Hermès Foundation, is going to say a few words. Thank you very much, Lina. Thank you to all of you present today. It, it always, it's always a specific uh, moment to uh, say a few words of conclusion. This is uh, the uh, sixth session of these uh, uh, seminars. This morning you heard uh, a series of exceptional conferences uh, talking about stone and they showed that this uh, material is uh, not inert but very much alive. We've seen a number of practices historical ones, uh, technical ones, uh, uh, um, uh, ending with a climax, uh, with mystical aspects uh, that are related to uh, stone. This program of the foundation, of the Hermes Foundation, which was created in 2008, uh, this is at the very heart of our remit. Through this program, we want to cultivate collective intelligence to uh, bring together uh, uh, the technique and also knowledge, uh, apprenticeship, uh, and all of this focused on one specific material. We also had documentary sessions, a geological a walk or several walks which were organized uh, around geology. We invite a number of professionals, craftsmen, engineers, designers, and this year we also invited a number of architects who pulled together their know-how to explore in a innovative uh, practices around one single material. The foundation uh, is very much expressed through this uh, academy. Our motto is the gestures that create us and reveal us. We want this uh, academy to be an incubator, incubator of um, uh, creative intelligence uh, to focus on uh, uh, on the investment, the strong investment of the m different educational directors that are working with us uh, all along this uh, series of seminars. I would like to thank uh, most particularly the architect which led uh, uh, this uh, series of seminars, Lina Gotme. She was very much, very much present. Uh, um, throughout this period, and it's not over. We have different workshop, workshops, days dedicated to other topics, so we were very delighted to welcome Lina Gautme. I would like to thank the team of the foundation and his uh, director, uh, also Julie Arnaud, in charge of this program, uh, along her team. Uh, they are in charge of the entire organization of these sessions and it's not an easy task to bring so many uh, guests and to organize these events. Also Hugues Jacquet, a sociologist who has accompanied us, is an expert in different know-hows and allowed this program to take shape. We've had 19 
uh, uh, speakers today, uh, uh, eminent speakers who took part in these conferences. I want to extend my warm thanks to them. Also to uh, actors or student actors uh, uh, who are part of the uh, Prépa Théâtre MC93 uh, school in Bobigny. They, they read those magnificent uh, uh, excerpts uh, who, which punctuated uh, these sessions. I uh, also want to thank Anna Fago. I want to give the floor back to Lina to say a few words. Thank you to uh, our various audiences who came to the different Saturdays of, these, uh, of this series. It's very important to have you. Uh, uh, and I would like you to return uh, for the next academy, uh, expert academy on the issue, on, on the topic of paper. It will be a riveting topic indeed. And next year, when we don't have the academy, the expert academy, we will publish among, uh, uh, along with Actes Sud, the publisher, a reference work uh, called Savoir et Faire. And you will have the book uh, dedicated to all of this series uh, on stone. Thank you very much. And I will give the floor back to Lina. Thank you very much, Olivier Fournier. So here we are. It is the end of this wonderful journey around stone and geology, uh, stone cutting, stone masonry, the construction of uh, uh, cathedrals, Alice Le Rouge, Jean-Michel Matania, among others. Uh, uh, they immersed us uh, in the world of stone for the first matinale. The second matinale uh, was dedicated to antiquity. Jean-Pierre Adam was there to understand the strength of stone and its capacity to uh, fashion the city with Osman, for instance. Uh, we talked about concrete also in the second session uh, with the specific stone, the liquid stone, as it was uh, then named with the voice of Cyril Simonet at the Pavillon de l'Arsenal, we talked about archaeology and architecture. Laila Armé talked about the subtraction of stones with the Nabataean people. Carl Frederick Schwentat and Pierre Bedeau talked about stone, stone masonry. And Philippe Ran also talked uh, in his very special lecture, a climatic one, a climatic stone for this last matinal. Uh, sorry, the previous one, we went to, from uh, Stone to Dust with Gilles Perraudin and then uh, Anne-Sophie Mouquin and Anne Varichon. And uh, we also had uh, the voice of uh, two actors, uh, student actors, that we want to thank warmly today. We will end today with, we ended today with this elevation uh, and uh, uh, the concluding words uh, will be, uh, were with uh, Stefan. It was a wonderful cycle of conferences. I would like to conclude this programming with my thanks to Hugues Jacquet, a socio-historian. Let's congratulate him. A round of applause for his contributions. Julie Arnaud, in charge of this project at the uh, Hermès Foundation. Another round of applause. Victoria Legan from the uh, foundation and Emma uh, can as well. Tazio, who has been taking pictures uh, and has walked around all of these uh, different venues. Our dear photographer, round of applause. Laurent Pejou, the director of the foundation, and Olivier Fournier, our president. Thank you for inviting us for all of these uh, sessions, all of our speakers. I want to extend my warm thanks our ac academy members who have joined me in this journey. And thank you to all of you uh, who uh, brought life to these conferences. Uh, long live Stone. And uh, before parting, uh, let's listen to music with Lamose, sound artist. Uh, Julien Chirol, also known as La Mose, will describe his installation, who, which was uh, uh, set up by the Ministry of Culture after the pandemic. It was designed for the site of Karnak. The sound installation is entitled L'Infini Limit, The Infinite Limit. Julien, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. 
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for your warm welcome. Thank you, Lina, for this warm introduction. And thank you to the foundation, the Hermes Foundation, to invite me to present my work entitled L'Infini Limit. It is a sound installation which I created, but which was also uh, made with the creative uh, studio uh, music unit based in Montreuil in Paris. Uh, which won an award uh, called Monde Nouveau, a New World. This uh, sound installation is uh, interactive and generative. Why interactive? Well, because it uh, responds to its environment. It may be noise, the words of the uh, viewers, uh, uh, the birds, the sound of the wind. It is equipped with uh, um, uh, an artificial intelligence uh, uh, equipment. Uh, uh, you can interpret it differently. Or it can interpret a uh, uh, partition differently, and it can interpret it according to uh, um, its environment. So this work was designed to be integrated uh, uh, harmoniously to the Karnak site, a megalithic site that you may know. You can see a picture here of this site. I will show you different uh, pictures in my presentation. So this piece is um, made uh, in this way. It's uh, made of metallonite, megalith in, in metal. Uh, the design is based on the uh, uh, dolmens or menus with a plateau uh, a platform which is 10 meters uh, uh, long and wide in granite as you may see in each structure you have a series of speakers and various sensors so what is the meaning uh, of uh, uh, me being here this morning or this afternoon to talk about this uh, sculpture, uh, this installation? I wanted to talk to you of uh, uh, stones uh, that sing, stones that are being uh, hit, and, uh, and in particular, singing stones. I won't give you the historical background of that piece uh, uh, of my proposal for this uh, Mont Nouveau call for project. Very rapidly, I'm giving you the, the background. There were recent works by the Swiss uh, uh, researcher Bettina Schulz-Polson. We believe that this uh, megalithic uh, site of Karnak is the most ancient in Europe, dating back from 5,000 5, years BC. And this site probably uh, uh, inspired all of the other such sites. Um, this megalithic culture, which was rolled out over a period of 3,000 years, and one of the last examples being the site of Stonehenge in England that you probably know since it is uh, extremely renowned. I uh, also drew my inspiration from other, another piece of research da dating back from 2012, whereby English researchers recreated uh, a, a, a miniature of uh, Stonehenge to measure its uh, acoustic qualities. They were therefore able to demonstrate that there was a very specific property in Stonehenge. The sounds emitted within uh, the enclosure of Stonehenge were amplified and cannot be heard outside of this enclosure. Uh, this architectural structure is uh, out in the open, very much open indeed, so it's quite surprising to find that. When I visited the Karnak site, uh, which is a, a very peaceful site, uh, uh, when you don't know, when you don't go there during the high season, which is now actually uh, um, starting from the summer, it is a very peaceful site otherwise, and you can see in the environment many dolmens, meniers plenty of them uh, in granite. And as a sound artist, as a musician, the first thing that came to mind when, while being there, this site for hundreds of years, for millenaries, uh, must have been very loud indeed, because these stones had to be cut. 
So this is a personal interpretation, obviously, but the very name of Karnak, according to me, which is quite rough in its sounding, Karnak, two C's, may, makes us think of the sound of the stone that has been carved on or uh, cut on. And I think that this sound must have resonated for a very long time. And uh, digging a little further my research, I wanted to create a sound piece, a musical piece, which would echo the sounds that could be pr produced by our ancestors and perhaps our musician ancestors or the sound producers of the time in the Neolithic, Neolithic age. And by doing some research, uh, looking at uh, some uh, remains uh, of um, uh, uh, musical instruments, obviously it's very hard to imagine what um, uh, instruments could look like, but we found tools which produce sounds. And here you can see this alignment of minions uh, uh, from, uh, uh, from above and here you see on this picture, all, not all researchers agree on this, but they may be called lithophones, uh, which uh, belongs to the um, Musée de l'Homme collection. Why are they called lithophone, lithophones? Here you have a few examples. You should know that these have been aligned here, as you can see on the picture, but not to look like the alignment of the Karnak site, but to uh, uh, to place their, their interpretation by musicians in a better uh, light or better sound, so to speak. And uh, they uh, measure 30 or 50 centimeters in terms of length, so they are quite big. And these stones belonged for a long time to the collection of the Musée de l'Homme. They were uh, collected over a period of 150 years on different African sites. Uh, a large part of them been, having been discovered in uh, the uh, desert of Tenere. And we didn't really know, it's not very well documented, uh, uh, what they were used for. Some of them were passed on from generation to generation within different nomadic tribes. And a few years ago, quite recently, in fact, uh, a research team realized that when you uh, strike these uh, stones, they produce, they emit a particular sound. Uh, but sounds that resemble uh, the sound that might come from instruments. Some of these stones, especially the black one you can see on this picture, uh, since uh, it has been renamed uh, uh, the, uh, the Stradivarius of lithophones, uh, and this um, so-called Stradivari Stradivarius stone has an exceptional quality. When you strike it, it resonates for seven seconds, more or less. So you can uh, strike all of the stones you may find on your way home after this uh, conference. And I can tell you that you won't find many that resonate more than half a second if you strike them. So uh, the idea came to use these instruments, these tools, uh, uh, which from our um, artistic point of view allows us a sort of uh, artistic license and to use them to make music. So these stones were discovered in very different periods of time, different places. We decided to bring them together. And here I'm showing you something different. We placed them on a virtual keyboard according to their tuning, a tuning uh, the tuning system that we use in the Western world. And uh, this led to a sort of vibraphone or xylophone to be able to play them and to use them. Uh, this was the agreement with the Musée de l'Homme. We uh, recorded each of these stones in different settings to allow other research teams or even the public to hear them and to play with them. Uh, let me uh, show you how, uh, what sound they produce. Yeah. When you play 
these tones for the first time. You, you can't imagine that this is going to be this, the sound. And this is the so-called Stradivarius stone. It's a stunning sound for a stone. This one is the one, the leftmost stone, the biggest one. This one that looks a bit like a bone. And by the way, I'll talk about bones a bit later. So this is being used as a xylophone or vibraphone, but we also realize that they offer a very specific and interesting sounded stone and there are many accidents and defects and when you rub them they also generate a very specific sound. So before I play an excerpt, as I said, it's an interactive, generative work, but it's also immersive. And when you are at the core, in the center of the structure, you're fully immersed, 360 degrees, with the loudspeaker broadcast system. And this is a system which is fully immersive, so we reproduce, so, I mean, you won't be in Kanak, so it won't be the typical Kermayo environment. But it will give you an idea of the experience you could live, you could uh, experience if you were to visit the site in Brittany. Before you listen, I'd like you to experience other music instruments that we found, more specifically, flutes made from bones. These are the examples here. They, these are part of the Musée de l'Homme collection. We can't play them because they're damaged and they no longer produce sound, but we managed to uh, copy them and get a perfect copy of these uh, uh, instruments uh, made from bone. And you will hear them in the uh, excerpt you're going to listen to, but don't forget that a bone is made of organic matter, but also of mineral matter. So we have this uh, mineral element inside our bodies. So let's listen to this excerpt while watching images from the site. 